Does it work? Okay, cool. Sorry, uh, sorry, I was late. I didn't get an update to the schedule for my own talk. That's, but anyways, um, this is going to be a quick talk. Um, so basically, on the goals of governance, um, for me, as far as who I am, I'm Matthew DeFrante, and the, the founder of ZK Labs, uh, a company that does security development research for Ethereum. I generally don't really participate too much in governments because it annoys me in general. But here is sort of my thoughts on uh, governance as a whole, sort of the current, some of the current issues in, in governance, and what what really we should be focusing on as you know, like as governance for governance as a process. So to me, uh, governance purely is not merely concerned with outcomes, but with the process of qualifying legitimate decision making, right? Because you're never gonna have a oracle for what to do that's right, you know? You're gonna make mistakes. Um, the, the, pro the point is to have a, to create a process, uh, governance, a robust process that allows you to recover from mistakes, uh, make sure they're not permanent, and make sure that the process for deciding what is uh, legitimate and what isn't legitimate doesn't get co-opted, right? Um, and uh, in, we have a lot to learn from, well, we have a lot to learn for what not to do from, uh, so let's say, traditional governments and politics, which I think is uh, probably is like totally broken at this point and, and irrecoverable. So we have a good, good clean slate in the sort of the, in this blockchain, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, programmable money ecosystem to start anew. So let's see. Uh, the first thing we should really talk about and consider is who do we consider part of the governance process? And I think this set generally gets, uh, is misappropriated. Uh, we really only think that the decision makers are directly involved in the governance process or should be directly involved. Uh, and you know, in, in the current uh, tra traditional political system, that would be again politicians or, or regulators or the people who are part of the bureaucracy. And in this current blockchain space, it's kind of to these two together, right? Developers and maintainers, let's say miners could be, could be the, main, the maintainer class, are the decision makers sort of by de facto because they're really the only ones who have, who have the uh, knowledge, uh, the, the access uh, to really push for real, de like effective decisions. But it isn't just this, right? The, the foundation goes much deeper. Um, and it's also the direct users of the protocol, uh, people who, let's say, uh, I consider in this class of direct users not just people using Ethereum directly, but um, like people who, uh, people or entities that provide a, a platform, platforms for, that use Ethereum, for example, so, you know, Coinbase or, or Kraken or whatever exchanges, um, the various dApps and so on, because those, you know, we, without, those, without the users, without the users' desires, um, the incentives, the, the wants, and the, the market they create, uh, the decision makers and, and the developers um, don't really have any bearing on anything, right? If you have a project no one uses, um, you can decide all you want for yourself. There's, it's, that's not controversial, right? Controversial gov governance becomes controversial when it impacts markets, when it impacts people's lives. And, and the larger the set that it impacts, the harder the, the governance becomes. Um, indirect users as well. Um, so that's, this would be users that don't um, yeah, aren't aware that they're directly interacting with the protocol. So, for example, uh, this would be perhaps a, a you know something like uh, with the th with the thing that DocuSign did recently, on where they're stamping some of their contract signatures on Ethereum um, for you know like auditability purposes, or, or um, you know with the thing that the, inter the Internet Archive does, uh, where the they uh, the or I had done the, at some point. That they take the root hash of uh, all the all the stuff that they've archived and, and throw it on you know big, as a Bitcoin transactions for uh, for like sort of a historical anti tamper chain and so on and so like these uh, are indirect users because they aren't aware that they're using these platforms but their use case benefits by proxy from these platforms existing right and really also a, a, a th uh, auxiliary class or, or a final class of, of users uh, is adversaries, right? And, and I think a lot of people uh, often forget about this, but they're kind of, they couldn't be an adverse, any 
one of these classes can have adversaries in it. Um, and I think that when in, you know, in, in nascent communities, uh, especially like the blockchain space, in Ethereum more specifically, um, which is quite young and the people heavily involved in the governance process have been sort of benef benevolent by default. Um, again, you know, in the first year or two, the, there wasn't much money uh, to be made, I, you know, unless you, were, unless you realized that what's gonna happen, um, you know, nobody really cared about Ethereum and sort of those people became sort of the de facto uh, authorities for a lot of the decision making. And, you know, we assume that people who rise to the top, we've kind of assumed now that the people who are, who are at the top and respected are benevolent, but that's really not the case. Uh, I mean, not that, it's, it's not that I'm calling anyone malicious, but it's not a good thing to assume long term, right? Um, there is much to be gained from being an adversary that's seen as a good entity. Um, and, you know, s a little bit of cynicism would go a long way to actually making robust protocols. In general, it, it's important, if you really want a decentralized ecosystem to exist, we all need to be participating actively in governance, right? Which either means calling out uh, th things that, you know, we know are wrong or, you know, being a supporter for things that we, we are sure is right. Uh, like signaling, you know, all the, all the calls for signaling are great, but uh, until it, they only really work if the majority is signaling, right? And if the majority is signaling in an informed way, right? And you don't, there's, there's big difference between just blind signaling and allowing misinformed signals, or not really misinformed, or muddy, muddy signals to emerge, and really allowing, and really sort of uh, building platforms for people to inform themselves and signal uh, and, and have a voice that is the right, that is sort of represented the right way. You know, and again, in, in the, if we go back to the traditional politics, uh, it's done in completely the wrong way, which is, you know, you have two choices, which is like bad and worst choice, and the signals, you are, you're not even allowed to choose what signals you get most of the time, right? The, the, main, in the mainstream media, and by that I mean sort of in, in, uh, in the US, for example, which is TV and a newspaper is, is all owned by, um, you know, the establishment, let's say, and it's, it's, it really filters down what arguments we're even allowed to consider, and, and that's bad. So signaling on, only really works when you are aware that and, and are able to get a good signal and get being are able to provide a good signal back, a good quality signal. So, um, in the, for as far as governance criteria, um, in terms of, you know, like for all the participants, really criteria for decisions should be as objective as possible and results oriented. Um, so, for example, the decision that incurs high cost or overhead must be worth the positive it provides or the negatives that it prevents. And really, like, uh, again, going back to why sort of the current world is bad, uh, in traditional uh, governance, in, in, you know, government, go, like government process, how, how bills are passed and so on, generally it's, it's a lot of fire and forget. You know, legislation is drafted, um, bundled in with a lot of crap that is completely uh, not even related, passed as a bundle, people don't even read it, uh, and then no matter what damages does, things don't get reevaluated. Um, there's, there's so much legislation that is either completely out of date by now or never really worked in the first place. It just kind of sounded like a good idea. It was, it was appe appealing, um, but it never actually tried to solve a real problem, right? And so that's, what's, that's really what you, one of the m biggest fundamentals you want to prevent uh, in your governance process is to have a process that ends up being optimized for what is appealing versus what is effective, right? And, and yeah, I think that there are parts of the current government that are tailored towards more what is effective, and, and those are generally the more niche parts, like um, you know, securities regulation, um, you know, for, for, for things that are well understood, um, but you know, things like you know, monetary policy or um, you know, like, uh, like welfare in general, kind of the way that welfare is administered, the cost of administering it is often far higher than the cost of just you know, giving everyone a basic income. It's, but you know, like the basic income is a controversial subject, 
So it doesn't, it's not, a, it's not as appealing to try and pass that versus, but and saying, hey, we have selective welfare, but the cost of being selective is higher than what would be the universal basic income anyway, but we don't care because it's an emotional argument, right? And emotional arguments is really what sh you want to sort of stay away from that as much as possible because otherwise everything ends up turning into, hey, you know, uh, the internet is bad because save the children, right? Like the children might be exposed to this and that. And, and so then you have a blank carte blanche to just do and, do and pass whatever you want. Um, just because you can rely on these emotional arguments and you can attack your opponents for not being on your side of the emotional argument, right? Like, oh, why, you know, if you have, again, in, in you know, uh, many times bills for, that are internet censorship bills get bundled in with things like, hey, you know, Protect the Children Act, and if the politicians who, you know, vote against it get branded as being enemies of children or whatever, and it's, it's too easy to fall into that if you don't maintain an objective criteria for what can even, what is even considered an argument for, um, you know, for the government's criteria. So, you know, here's an ex a good example that, I, that I've, you know, thought a lot about, and, and sort of everyone's favorite example um, uh, for drama, fund recovery. Um, so, if you sort of want to go through this criteria, you can say, what does it really, what does fund recovery affect really? So it affects layer one transaction finality, right? Because uh, without overwhelming uh, social consensus generally, again, in like in the example of the DAO fork, there is no established process, there is no expected process for if something goes wrong, if you know a contract goes wrong or, or I send a bad transaction, whatever, that it's gonna get rewarded, right? There isn't anything to expect there, and the, uh, the only thing you can expect is huge resistance, right? But if you make a process to recover it, or if you start having a, um, an expectation or, or repeated behavior of things getting reversed, whatever that criteria is, it really changes the, it, well, it affects this property, right? And the, the benefit is rescue locked funds, right? So uh, the, the amount of, you can say, okay, you can estimate, guesstimate, how many lock funds happen in a year, how many people are likely to actually go through the claims process and, and so on, and, and see, okay, you know, the benefit might be uh, you know, 100 million or 200 million per year that are rescued that would have been lost otherwise. Um, and what's the benefit of that really, considering a lot of ICOs have happened in the past two years and you know, we've almost got nothing out of it? You know, du you know dubious, but we'll see. Um, What's the risk? It changes, like, it's a bigger risk because it changes expectations for a, fundamental pro for a fundamental property that the protocol relies on, right? So it's quite, it's quite a big change and it, it involves a lot of unknowns. If you, and I think actually we have had a bit of a test of, the, of this with, uh, for example, EOS, which was, a, you know, in fairness, a very badly designed process for, for fund recovery, you know, where you, somebody, put out a, a PDF that was signed and things, you know, uh, accounts would just randomly get frozen. But it sort of shows that if you change this core property that sort of people are used to in, the, in, in blockchains, uh, it can get co-opted very easily. It can be used for DOS. Um, it can be used for headaches and so on. And if you wanted, uh, again, there's, this is something that is easy to make an emotional argument for. Uh, you know, oh, hey, you know, don't, don't you want people to get re regain their property? You know, it's, it affects people's lives and whatever, but really you want to have qualitative arguments and, qua and, and well, quantitative arguments that say, okay, if we do this, this is the, this is the expected benefit, this is the expected negative, and is it really worth it without um, relying on, you know, hypotheticals. And so if you wanted an objective way to argue for fund recovery, the way that I would approach it is, uh, you know, take Bitcoin for example. Bitcoin has um, two transaction types really. It has the normal transaction type, which is just, you know, signature, whatever. And then it has, uh, I mean, a, the script transaction type, which supports an atom, which is pay to script hash. And that's a multi-sig, right? That, that, that code was really kind of invented for multi-sigs. And multi-sigs in, in uh, and Bitcoin are kind of protocol supported, right? And in Ethereum, they aren't really. So sort of you had to, you have to write your own smart contract for each different type of multi-sig, and, and it's a big piece of work, and it's error prone. So perhaps you could you could make the argument that 
because it's such an error prone process, perhaps we should have three transaction types in Ethereum, one which is signature signature, signature, one which, one which is many signature, multi-signature, and one which is contract execution, right? And so you say, okay, we replace all the smart contracts, flawed, whatever, um, of the multi-signature type with the multi-signature opcode and prevent this from ever happening in the future because it clearly, it seems like it's, it's a class that's very risky to re-implement, right? And so you can say, oh, okay, you know, it's at least that's an objective follow-through and, and, and can't, cannot be easily ex extended to arbitrary criteria. This was a very specific, okay, an oversight in the initial protocol, we should have had multiple signature accounts. Okay, while we, add, while we add that to the protocol, let's also retroactively fix what we can, right? And so that's, that's a good objective way to go about um, you know, an argument like this, is like, so then it doesn't, because then if you go, if you argue in this way, it no longer affects layer one transaction finality. You're only saying this was a protocol def deficiency and we're fixing that deficiency, right? Okay, so, and moving on, uh, I get a good segue is incentives, right? So incentives are difficult in governance because what's desirable to any one side in terms of how the process looks like is generally undesirable to the whole. And what I mean by that is when you're the majority, you want to stay the majority. But when you're the minority, you want to have, make it easy for the minority to become the majority. Um, it's neither of which is good because it ends up like, regardless of which strategy you use, one becomes a, a, you know, like an authoritative government, the other one becomes a, a tug of war like we have with like the two-party process. I mean, the, the two-party system in, in most, uh, in like the US and the UK, for example. So you really kind of want a, a meta-stable system which, uh, it, from which the rules are set uh, for not just the current environment, but to prevent adversarial environments in the future. Um, and it's quite hard to do, but I think it's possible if, uh, you know, if you, if you really set things up in the correct way. Um, and, and you make sure that changes to not, on, not only pro your proposals for changes to, to protocols or, or the actual use, you know, like the real world are done through objective criteria, but also changes to the process itself are done through very objective criteria. Um, and and it's, it's just pretty much in, there's really no way to do that. There's no shortcut to that other than to Im ensure everyone is involved in the, in the process, right? And also not to trust too much um, the people who are, who, are, who are the most heavily involved because the people who are the most heavily involved in or the most vocal, the most available in governance are generally, don't, do not generally have to be the ones that are best trusted with governance because again, for example, you know, for me, and for many other you know, people who are like full-time developers, we don't have time to be on every single call and go through all the EIPs and you know, be, be up to date on what the latest drama is on every single issue because um, we're doing stuff, right? And because we're doing stuff, we have greater perspective on stuff that, on, on issues and, and you know, fundamentals that people who are deeply involved in government process do not. So it's, you know, you've got to make sure that you partition your categories properly and you perceive signals from each category instead of just saying, oh, this guy shows up a lot in all the discussions, he must know what he's talking about. No, that really just means that he likes to argue, right? Or, or that he's really good at being involved in discussions. It doesn't mean that he knows what he's talking about most of the time. So again, really just make sure that you are processing signals correctly. And a good example of this, and again, in the real world, is uh, the EU Galileo satellite project. Now that the the uh, UK, so the, uh, the UK was involved in this because it was a UM, EU member state, and so it's a new satellite. For people who don't know, it's a new satellite constellation. So it's similar to GPS, um, but um, with better features. And there's some features that are only available to member states. And the UK was like, um, let's make the features that are available to member states more. Like there should all these features, half of them should be available to member states instead of just one, right? And now that they're getting kicked out of the EU, they won't have access to those features anymore and they're lobbying against it because they're like, hey, we want access to the features again now uh, because we're, we're no longer the EU, but we paid for developing it, therefore we, it should be a special arrangement. But So again, it's like while, while you're in the majority and you're benefiting from being able to influence the process, you have one set of incentives. When you get kicked out of that process, 
and you don't have access to the incentives you create to the features you created, now you want the, uh, another set of incentives, right? So it's really you really got to make sure that you're thinking about both sides. That if you, whenever you're creating a process, you you have to really you have to think, would I trust this process in the hands of my worst enemy? If the answer is no, then you probably should rethink your process. Um, you know, again, there's limits, but so I think it, you can summarize it as it's better to make a bad choice with good governance than to make a good choice with broken governance. If you make a good choice, making a good choice with broken governance is, is I think, the most risky things because it legitimizes the broken governance process. People that trust something that's fundamentally broken can be easily co-opted and so on. And that's it. I mean, it's, it's done, right? Like, it's so hard to recover from uh, a misplaced trust. Whereas uh, making a mistake, you know, there's mistakes are inevitable. But making a mistake with good governance is fine because once you, you can retroactively realize that it was a mistake, you know, again, with your strict set of criteria, you can, you know, remedy it, right? Uh, and uh, hopefully, if your criteria were good enough, the, the damage in initially was limited anyway. So, uh, as a, a sort, of, sort of as a final point, good governance favors what benefits the majority, and bad governance val uh, values what appe appeases the majority, right? Ger what, what we have the, today in most democratic governments is really uh, the thing, th the vast majority of stuff gets passed, the politicians get elected and so on, or what appease the majority versus what benefit the majority. And we have really got a chance to flip this, right, in, in blockchain governance and sort of in uh, this new kind of uh, technology assists the governance, let's say, that you can, uh, you know, with qualitative data, with strict governance process, you can really make sure that uh, you push for this, you only really allow through decisions that benefit the majority versus allowing decisions that can easily be spun into feeling like they are good for the majority, but actually are just good for a small set or, you know, a very small um, number of people, right, subset of parties. Um, yep, and that's sort of the final point. I, I think that's it. Um, that was 30 minutes. Uh, any questions?